In the first two sessions of today's class, we covered the bones and joints, and then the muscles that make up the antebrachium. The neurovascular components are the focus of this third and final session. Welcome back. Having discussed the musculoskeletal components of the antebrachium, we complete the picture by turning our attention to the neurovascular structures of the forearm. Now, these include the arteries supplying blood to, the veins draining blood away from, and the nerves that innervate the muscles of the anterior and posterior antebrachial compartments. We'll also consider the course of the neurovascular supply for the hand as it does pass through the forearm to reach its destination. And we'll finish everything off with a look at the surface anatomy in the forearm. Let's start with a look at the arterial supply to the forearm. In the brachium, we observe the path of the brachial artery and the collateral branches it supplied. In the distal portion of the cubital fossa, the brachial artery divides into two large vessels of the antebrachium, which are named according to the bones that they run in proximity to. The radial artery with the radius and the ulnar artery with the ulna. Both can be found in the anterior compartment where they supply the vasculature to the lateral and medial aspects of the compartment, respectively. Just distal to the split, the ulnar artery supplies an additional important branch, the common interosseous artery, which further branches to form the anterior and posterior interosseous arteries. The anterior branch supplies the deepest structures in the anterior compartment, while the posterior branch courses through an opening between the radius and ulna, just proximal to the interosseous membrane, to supply the posterior compartment of the forearm. Also note the location of the anterior and posterior ulnar recurrents and the radial recurrent and recurrent interosseous branches that anastomose with the collateral branches which were discussed in the previous lesson. Again, the veins of the antebrachium are more variable in distribution compared to the arteries, but are generally named for the arteries they accompany. We also continue to see vena comitantis, arrangement of two bilateral deep veins for each artery. Superficially, we see the continuation of the basilic and cephalic veins, with a number of unnamed, highly variable subbranches which drain into each. We can also pick up the course of a few of the nerves that continue from the brachium into the antebrachium. The median nerve continues through the cubital fossa, entering the anterior compartment through the bifurcation in the pronator teres muscle. It immediately starts to extend sensory branches to the elbow joint and motor branches to all muscles in the anterior compartment, save the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. One of these branches, the anterior interosseous nerve, courses with the anterior interosseous artery to supply the deep compartment of the muscles, terminating with sensory branches to the wrist joint. The main branch of the median nerve continues to travel through a neurovascular plane between the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus muscles. In the distal region of the forearm, the main branch gives off the palmar cutaneous branch, which courses through the superficial palmar fascia, providing cutaneous innervation to the lateral palmar surface of the hand. The main branch then passes through the carpal tunnel between the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor pollicis longus tendons to enter the hand. Here, it provides motor branches to a number of important muscles in the lateral aspect of the hand and sensory nerve branches to the anterolateral surface of the hand as well. Following its course posterior to the medial epicondyle, the ulnar nerve passes between the heads of flexor carpi ulnaris to enter the anterior compartment of the antebrachium. At this point, it provides two motor branches to the surrounding muscles, one to the flexor carpi ulnaris, providing its exclusive innervation, and the other to flexor digitorum profundus. Interestingly, the flexor digitorum profundus is an example of a muscle with dual innervation. Generally speaking, motor units in the medial half of the muscle are innervated by the ulnar nerve, while motor units in the lateral half of the muscle are innervated by the median nerve. The nerve then courses past the wrist, where it will supply the majority of intrinsic hand muscles, as well as cutaneous sensation over the medial aspect of the hand. We pick up the path of the radial nerve from the lateral side of the cubital fossa, just deep to the brachioradialis muscle, after it has given off all of the motor branches to the posterior compartment of the arm, as discussed in the previous lesson. 
In this location, the nerve gives off the superficial branch, which courses cutaneously through the posterior aspect of the forearm to supply the skin in this region, continuing past the wrist to supply the skin along the posterior aspect of the hand. The deep branch of the radial nerve continues to follow the underside of brachioradialis, entering the posterior antebrachial compartment by penetrating the supinator muscle. It branches extensively with the supinator muscle, providing motor branches to all the muscles of the posterior compartment. It terminates in this region as there are no intrinsic muscles in the dorsum of the hand. In addition to the muscular compartments, all three of these nerves provide cutaneous branches to the forearm and hand. First of all, note the location of the medial and lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerves, which we saw in the lessons on the axilla and brachium, projecting from the medial cord of the brachial plexus and musculocutaneous nerve, respectively. Now note the cutaneous arrangement of the median, ulnar, and radial nerves. Cutaneous branches from the radial nerve cover the posterior surface of the forearm, and the superficial branch of the radial nerve, specifically, is responsible for the skin over the posterior lateral surface of the hand. Cutaneous branches from the median and ulnar nerves cover some of the skin proximal to the wrist, as well as the majority of skin within the hand. We'll revisit this in the next lesson on the hand. Paresthesia in any of these locations is an early indication of a developing neuropathy, and the precise location helps clinicians to pinpoint precisely which nerve is being compromised. One final note on the surface anatomy of the forearm. The bulk of the forearm is oriented proximally, representing the muscular bellies of the anterior and posterior compartment, respectively. As previously discussed, the fleshy tissue over the lateral epicondyle represents the common extensor tendon. Inflammation in this region is known as lateral epicondylitis, or more commonly, tennis elbow. It results from microscopic tearing of the bone tendon or musculotendon junctions that is typically secondary to repetitive forceful wrist extension, as is often seen in racket sports. The fleshy portion over the medial epicondyle is the location of the common flexor tendon. Medial epicondylitis is less commonly discussed, but results from chronic forceful wrist flexion motions. Now, this one's commonly referred to as golfer's elbow. Distally, the forearm thins out into the tendons that insert on the wrist or pass into the hand. Note, once again, the anatomical snuff box. In slender individuals, the superficial veins we have previously identified can also be seen. That wraps up this lesson on the antebrachium. In the next session, we complete our journey into the upper limb with the terminal and most important part of the destination, the hands. So until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.